My name is Carrie van der Weyden. I'm a haematologist. Um, I'm also a researcher and I work at the clinical haematology unit that sits in um, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is, as the name implies, um, is a type of lymphoma that t involves the skin um, and tends to also be a group of lymphomas where the abnormal cell is a T-cell. So cutaneous T-cell lymphoma in and of itself describes a whole group of different conditions that fit under one banner. The most common subtypes of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that we see in the clinic and the most common ones that we see globally are a condition called mycosis fungoides and a condition that I like to think of as being the cousin of mycosis fungoides which is called Cesare syndrome. There are a number of other conditions that also fit under the heading of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma some of them are incredibly rare and we might only see one of those patients per year. The other most common group of conditions that I see in the clinic uh, fit under the heading of what we call CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, which is a mouthful and is an unpleasant thing to say, but essentially describes a group of conditions which look very similar when we do a biopsy and look at them down the microscope because they all have very strong expression of a particular protein on the surface called CD30. And there are several subtypes that fit under that heading that go by the name of primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma or something called lymphomatoid papulosis. Um, and we might put those to one side because they're rare, uh, but again, because I work in a specialist centre, I tend to see a fair number of patients with those conditions. Um, so to return to the ones that are the most common in that group of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. So mycosis fungoides is a condition whereby you get abnormal T-cells or abnormal blood cells that tend to behave badly and but sit in the skin as opposed to other types of lymphomas which tend to sit in lymph glands which are either in the neck, in the groin, under the arms or um, clustered around bodily organs um, and can behave in quite variable ways. So mycosis fungoides in and of itself um, describes a, a condition that can behave in very different ways depending on what its stage is. And this can sometimes scare people where they get a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides, they Google it and they say, oh, this is a blood cancer, this is a lymphoma, and immediately start to fear that this is something that's going to progress and cause them significant um, symptoms and cause them to require significant amounts of treatment. And that's actually not the case for the majority of patients who have mycosis fungoides. Um, in general terms, this can be a very indolent process, and by that I mean it just kind of hangs around and is there on the skin, doesn't really cause many people very symptoms, uh, cause people very many symptoms. Um, can just be limited, so people can have just one small area of mycosis fungoides on their body, um, and it can be just what we call patches and plaques, so a little bit of area of discoloured skin that sometimes may be itchy or scaly. Um, and the way I think about it is you may have a large number of patients who actually have this condition and no, never get a biopsy done and so never realise that they have mycosis fungoides. For patients who have very limited involvement of their skin with mycosis fungoides, sometimes people don't require any treatment whatsoever. Um, if people have more widespread involvement of their skin, sometimes people will require more intensive treatment with skin-directed therapies, and that can be anything from steroids applied to the skin or what we call light therapy, so things like UVB or PUVA therapy, so UVA therapy. Um, there are a group of people who have more progressive mycosis fungoides, and that means it tends to involve much more of the body surface area. Um, and that people can get symptoms from that. So things that my patients commonly experience um, are, is itching or discomfort from the skin. Sometimes those areas that are affected by the skin lymphoma can be more fragile or, or, and break down. And so people, they can crack and bleed. Um, sometimes people will present to us because 
it's significant in its cosmetic effects. So pe people will notice that it's on their skin and people seek medical attention because of that. Um, in other times, um, we do see that there's a group of patients where the mycosis fungoid is, is much more advanced and we see much more of the body surface being covered by areas of patch or pluck. Sometimes it can grow into thickened areas that are what we call tumours, so look like little nodules on the skin. And that group of patients often require more intensive therapy. Cesare syndrome, I kind of think of as being um, an, uh, mycosis fungoides where we can see changes in the skin, but we can also see those abnormal cells in the blood when we do specialist tests to look at the type of lymphocytes, so a particular type of white cells, um, and look at the, the subsets of those lymphocytes in the blood. So it's almost as if you have changes in the skin that spill over into the blood that we can find there. And for that group of patients, they can have very significant um, symptoms. So very commonly patients will have very red and inflamed skin. It's very common for all of their skin to feel uncomfortable and very itchy. Um, and people can have also um, very thickened and indurated skin that feels quite leathery and uncomfortable. People also notice that they seem to be more vulnerable to infection because the skin becomes more fragile. Um, compared to people who don't have this condition uh, and so things like skin-based infections are something that I deal with a lot in my group of patients. Um, the other thing that we can see in patients with mycosis fungoides is a change in the way the lymphoma behaves over time and can, we can sometimes see this thing called large cell transformation. Again, um, something that I see a little bit of because I happen to work in a specialist centre where we see patients from all around the country with this condition. But in that we see that the cells tend to behave in a more aggressive fashion. So in that setting, um, we, patients may have to develop bigger tumours that sometimes can ulcerate or break down. Or in the most extreme form, it can actually spread to other organs in the body. Again, that's the most rare group of patients that I look after. The majority of patients who we see in clinic um, are what we call early stage mycosis fungoides and don't really require any intensive therapy whatsoever. So treatment for this group of conditions, uh, the way that I tend to think about it is early stage versus advanced stage. So early stage tends to be um, not very much involvement of the skin, maybe one or two patches or a few patches only, um, no involvement of the blood at all. And that group of patients tends to respond very well to simple things like steroids applied to the skin or light therapies. For patients where we see that the condition seems to be more widespread, um, we often talk about what's called systemic therapy. So not things that are just applied to the skin, but actually have an effect on the whole body. The interesting thing about this group of conditions is that compared to other types of lymphomas, we know that chemotherapy actually isn't very effective. And so the types of treatments that we think about are ones that try to modify the immune system to try and remind the immune system to seek out and suppress the abnormal cells that are behaving badly. So some of the common things that we may use in the clinic are things like interferon, which is a naturally occurring protein that your body makes in response to infections um, such as the flu. Um, we also sometimes use groups of medications which uh, fit into things like the histone deacetylase inhibitors and then a whole group of other things which have only just come onto the Medicare benefit schedule, um, which is actually really exciting that we have access to for people whose conditions progress. For patients who have Cesare syndrome, um, the other things that we think about in that setting tend to be prioritising systemic therapies earlier in people's disease course, but also perhaps um, because I work at a, a centre where this is offered, we have a particular type of treatment called extracorporeal photophoresis, which is um, a fancy way of trying to re-educate the immune system using um, a, a blood washing device, for want of a better term. Um, the tricky thing about mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome is that it's because it's incredibly rare, when we try and look at 
best approaches to treatment and look at what people are doing all over the world, there is a little bit of variation in what people do. And so sometimes we encourage people to get involved with centres of excellence, particularly around Australia, that specialise in looking after this condition. So I happen to work at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, which has a combined multidisciplinary clinic where we have input from haematologists like myself, but also dermatologists, so people who look after people with skin conditions, um, specialist nurses in the area, and patients, uh, and sorry, and clinicians who um, treat uh, using radiation oncology methods. There are other centres in other states, so particularly in New South Wales and in um, Western Australia, there are groups of clinicians who have a particular interest in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and so there are groups of um, specialists who work in all of those areas. Um, if you live outside of those areas, though, it doesn't mean that your uh, clinicians don't have access to that, so we happen to run an online multidisciplinary uh, meeting uh, twice a month now where um, clinicians can actually ring up and present their cases and that means that um, they can not only present the story of what's been happening with the patient's condition, they can present de-identified photos with the permission of the patient and they can have the uh, biopsies and blood tests and scans all reviewed by a panel of experts and there's often quite lively discussion about mm, do we have the right diagnosis in this setting um, what do we think is the best approach to treatment? What are the options that are available? Um, so it's really quite a valuable resource for clinicians who don't see this incredibly rare condition every week like I do.